Bob Dylan, Tangled Up in Blue, Revolution in the Air. Welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vretos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College here in New York City. The Port Huron Statement, written collectively by social and political activist Tom Hayden and a small group of student activists at the University of Michigan in 1962, became a powerful manifesto of movement building for a more just society half a century ago. It starts in this way. We are people of this generation, bred in at least modest comfort, housed now in universities, looking uncomfortably to the world we inherit, began to see complicated and disturbing paradoxes in our surrounding America. Although mankind desperately needs revolutionary leadership, America rests in national stalemate. Its goals ambiguous and tradition bound instead of informed and clear. Its democracy system apathetic and manipulated rather than of, by, and for the people. Our work is guided by the sense that we may be the last generation in the experiment with living. The statement could easily be mistaken for a call to action by student activists on many American university campuses today. 1968 represented the tumultuous high watermark of the movement in America and around the world. The counterculture, the civil rights movement, anti-war movement, the women's movement, and many other movements that tried to radically transform America and the world culminated in America in the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, continuation of the Vietnam War, and the election of the right-wing Nixon administration. America is taking a long look at 1968 again. Columbia University, among many other universities, is having three major events celebrating and debating the tumultuous student rebellion of 1968. And we too, at the radical imagination, want to dialogue about that monumental year, and we'll have several shows during the year doing just that. Mark Rudd, a leader of the Columbia Revolts, will be on next week's show. But today we're very pleased and excited to start that narrative with Mitch Abador, a brilliant and militant translator and historian, <laughs> widely renowned, as he puts it, in small circles. Among his books are translations of Jean Jaurès, Victor Serge, Benjamin Fondan, and Emmanuel Bohm, as well as anthologies on the anarchist propagandists of the Deed, the Paris Commune, and the Sans Culottes of the French Revolution. His book, May Made Me, an oral history of the 1968 uprising in France, has led to a forthcoming article in the New York Times where he will discuss the many Mays during May 68 a worker may, a student may, and a may of conservative France. His circles are expanding rapidly, wider and wider, <laughs> as he remains a proud and true third generation Brooklynite. <laughs> and before we meet M uh, Mitch, here's a brief clip of the events of 1968 in France. The Columbia strike may have reminded people of the Paris Commune, but May 68 in France was the real thing. What began as a student protest for reform of the archaic, authoritarian French university system sparked a general strike that electrified the country. They were anarchists, most of them. That was the spirit. Uh, the slogan was all power to the imagination, uh, that you can do anything, you know, that we don't have to live with all the various forms of repression, which we're used to. So it was anti-capitalist, but that was just part of this general complete sort of cultural revolution that the, uh, the French students were anticipating. And so it's interesting that although they were the furthest out in any way politically, that was also the one place where workers joined with students and almost toppled the government. May 10th, the night of the barricades. 20,000 students marched in the Latin Quarter. Police and students clashed. Street fighting went on for weeks. 
The rioting and marches of up to half a million people frightened not only President de Gaulle, but the French Communist Party as well. The old left thought this new left was out of control. They had impossible dreams. The two principal slogans, I think, were quotations from uh, Marx and Rimbaud. Uh, from Marx, uh, let us change the world. From Rambo, let us change life. Carlos Fuentes, the Mexican novelist, was an active participant in May 68, along with many international students caught up in the excitement. What there was is a sense of extraordinary uh, brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, there was this capacity to embrace people in the streets. Uh, there were couples kissing. There were couples that fell apart because they did not share political views. Paris was divided by the River Seine as never before. On the left bank, you had the, the left, the revolutionaries, the dreamers. On the right side, you had the conservatives, you had the Gaullists, you had the fi financiers, the money people, the bourgeoisie. So the city was divided uh, as much as in uh, Les Miserables, in Victor Hugo, or in any of the great occasions of this city that seems to need a great uh, revolutionary explosion from time to time. Eventually, the May uprising subsided. The powerful trade unions controlled by the communists refused to take part and police kept up relentless pressure. But over time, the students did succeed in reforming and modernizing the French educational system, and they rejuvenated the Socialist Party, which a decade later became the elected government of France. It became a great, gigantic fraternal feast in which everybody was kissing everybody, embracing everybody, patting everybody on the back, and saying how happy they were and how free they felt. And this was contagious. It was marvelous, and I don't think we'll ever see it again. So, Mitch, everybody yes. kissing, everyone will never see this again. It's great to have <laughs> you here. It <laughs> really is. Good to be here, Jim. This is uh, fascinating stuff. We need your help. Our audience needs your help here in ferreting out all the things that we're watching. Well, there were many things, you know, was going right on? in that clip. Yeah. And there and were and many you, things you wrong in that clip. There's a lot of things wrong. Okay, and you, through many of your writings, this is your... Newest book here, right? May Made May Me. May right. Made Me. Okay, right, right here. And, and so help us understand the conflict, the divisions. What was going on there? Sure. So, for example, when uh, Carlos Fuentes, or no, I'm sorry, the narrator, mm -hmm. says that uh, the workers refuse to participate, right. and, which is absolutely false. Okay. Absolutely false. That in, in, the, in the student... Well, right, but that was what I said. Th okay. th that what was said in there was that the student, uh, the workers refused to participate, and so it all ended and whatever. Right. However, the, the fact is, yeah. the f it all began on May third, nineteen sixty-eight, and there were no workers involved. It w it began when uh, the police uh, invaded or went into the, the courtyard of the Sorbonne. The students felt that this was violating a sanctuary. Do we need to go back to possibly March, the sure. March 22nd so movement, to give us a little more of a... Sure, okay. Sure. And, and, and let's, let's so see. The, so the what great animating movement of, yes. of, of the beginning of, of May 68 okay. was the March uh, 22nd movement, and everybody knows it best as being led by Daniel Cohn-Bendit, right. who was uh, uh, attacked by the, uh, one of the leaders of the Communist Party as a German anarchist, which then became the famous chant, we are all German Jews. Right, right. Okay. But it was the March 22nd movement. On March 22nd, the students at Nanterre. Where he was a student. Where he was a student. Yeah. Occupied the administrative uh, offices. Okay. And this was after uh, some students from Nanterre had been arrested after uh, smashing a, an, an American Express office near the opera. Okay. okay. And they were going to be expelled. Right. So the students, they protested. There had already been a number of protests at Nanterre, all of which involved Daniel Cohn-Bendit. And the causes that they were... They were fighting, for example, oh. over causes familiar to us. Yes. They were fighting over um, women, uh, boys and girls having right to visit each other in their dorms. Right. Okay. And Cohn-Bendit himself was nearly expelled mm -hmm. for confronting the Minister of Youth and Sport. Believe it or not, there was a minister of youth and sport. Youth and sport, wow. F 
uh, who had told the kids, give, it, give, give, tr give Trump time. We may have that here, too. Well, <laughs> may, all right. Anyway, sorry. And, go ahead. And, so, sorry. Hmm. And, who, and who had set, told the students, if they're so obsessed with, with swimming, then maybe they need to all, like, just go for a swim. Right. With sex, they should all go for a yeah, swim. Right. Without the visit. So forget about the Cone Bendit, right. you know, uh, insulted the minister. He was hmm. almost expelled. Yeah. So there had already been stuff brewing at this bizarre campus that was Nanterre. It was set up outside of Paris to decongest the Latin Quarter intentionally. In a more working class. Not really. Not it was, really? It was, no? it okay. was uh, if you were from, I think it was the western part of Paris, that was where you now w went. Okay. And so, I mean, I interviewed many people who were at uh, Nanterre who took part in the occupation on March 22nd. And in fact, one of my favorite stories in the book is a young woman who uh, was at Nanterre, and so they knew they were occupying, m March 22nd, they're occupying in the evening. Mm -hmm. And it was her mother's birthday. Hmm. And so they were going out to take mom out for, for a birthday dinner. <laughs> so she told her parents, could you do me a favor, could we like go out a little bit earlier, and then we'll all have dinner together, and then you drop me off at school, and I'll go occupy it. And that was just what, the, what they did. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so March 22nd, there was that occupation. There was all kinds of stuff going on at Nanterre. It was closed down temporarily. And in May, there was going to be the disciplinary council I that see. was going to decide the fate of these of students. The students from March so 22nd. Right. So, so this, was, uh, this was in May. And so on May 3rd, the cops invade uh, the Sorbonne. And the students from the Sorbonne and from Nanterre who were there Everybody told me who was there, they have no idea why what happened happened. It was just enough was enough. And they started throwing stones at the cops. Hmm. And that was spontaneous when... Spontaneous. Spontaneous. There okay. was absolutely nothing planned. Nothing going on. Anymore. Nothing's going on. Okay. And so the... Uh, the uh, cops responded. The, the cops responded, and this was the beginning. So nothing much happens over the weekend. The following week, there's demonstrations uh, are really picking up the week of March 4th, 5th, 6th. So there's demonstrations all week, and it's all just students. The workers, in fact, it was on May 3rd that Marché mm. from the Communist Party had called uh, Combendit, the German anarchist, had condemned the students as the children of the bourgeoisie and accused them of adventurism and the workers should have nothing to do with this. And even earlier they had said, you gotta keep the students out of the, away from the factories. Hmm. They're going to want to come and make trouble. This is the French Communist Party's leadership. The French Communist Telling Party's leadership. Okay. Keep the keep the Not students the away. The workers. And right. Stuff. Okay. So, uh, but we can come back to that because okay. the rank and file workers, you know, we shouldn't say they had no role to play in in that also. Anyway, so stuff goes on, and then on May 10th, and this was in the in that clip that uh, we just saw, the students they had marched all around Paris, and they get back to the Latin Quarter and. They'd already they'd dispersed every night. When the cops had said to disperse, they dispersed. For some reason, on May 10th, the students said no. At this point, the students were like pretty m angry with the leadership, which had arisen spontaneously. Right. You know that. You know we. That it's one of the things that distinguishes May 68 from something like Occupy is, whereas Occupy made a fetish of horizontality and no leadership, very quickly leadership spontaneously grew out of what was going on in May from the March 22nd movement, from unions of uh, students and unions of the Professor university, university staff. Right, yeah. university yeah. staff. Three, so basically. Yeah. Right, three. Okay. It was Geismar, Alain Geismar, from the, uh, uh, the, the, from the professors, Kohn Bendit from March 22nd, and uh, Jacques Sauvageau from the uh, National Union of Students. There right. were other people on the fringes also, like Alain Cravine, who was the head of the Trotskyist group, the young uh, Jeunesse Communiste Révolutionnaire, the Revolutionary Communist Youth, a couple of other people. But not so many, uh, they said these were all anarchists, that's not the case. It's right? not the case, or and that Marxist was also said that, 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 right? that, that, you know, Cohn Bendit was an anarchist. Okay. And a conscious anarchist. Okay. He was part of a group called Rouge et Noir, and he had had a really thorough political education from his brother, Gabriel, 
who was a teacher in Saint-Nazaire, working class left-wing city in Brittany. So he mm -hmm. was a thoroughly educated, politically educated mm -hmm. uh, figure. He knew just what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but right, there were Marxists, there were anarchists. Maoists kind of kept themselves apart. They were right in the neighborhood at the Ecole Normale, all studying under Althusser. Yeah. But they thought this was just petty bourgeois foolishness. They weren't <laughs> anything to do with it. So anyway, so May 10th is the barricades. Okay. The night of the barricades, as we saw. And the communists meet the, over the weekend. The communist leadership meets over the weekend. And that takes us to the 11th and 12th. And on the 13th, they call a strike. To decide what to do. What okay, to and they, and they yeah. at this point, had already decided the, the, uh, they were going to keep themselves, still protect themselves from the students trying right. to take everything over. But they were involved. So from May 13th, there's humongous unitary worker and student demonstrations through Paris. And this is where I, you know, I discovered through my conversations with people who participated in both the planning and who participated in this, that a little bit of revisionism is needed. Because the work of the students, everything that they said at this time, was uh, we need worker-student unity. And they were fixated at that. Absolutely, that's exactly the word. Intellectually, yeah, right. intellectually felt that that was a right. natural, they were natural right. allies that were trying to make them self Precisely. natural allies. And, yeah. and, it was, and it was such an ingrained part of every education. segment yeah. of, of the French left. Because, yeah. you know, the anarchist movement, they flew the red and the black flags. And it was a real uh, working class oriented uh, movement, even if there weren't many workers in it. And uh, the Communist Party had been well implanted. Many people had transited through the Communist Party, moved on to Maoism or Trotskyism or Guevarism and every subset Isn't of, there, right, yeah, there was within Marxism. But workerism uh -huh. is really, was really essential to them. So the students were constantly talking about the working class, the working class, the working class. You know, if you see uh, films uh, of the marches, there all, there's always something about worker-student unity. And they're also always singing the Internationale. And they were ready to subsume their own energy for the workers, right? They would follow the workers. Okay. Lead at this point, would, or would they? The, the well, uh, and, and that's where it becomes interesting. So okay. the workers and students are marching together. Okay. And it was Alain Crevine, who, was, who had been in the Communist Party and expelled for uh, Trotskyism, or it might have been Guevarism, they might have thrown him out for. But he was, uh, if you watch films of it, he's a, you know, a handsome uh, guy with a great head of Trotsky hair mm -hmm. and leader of the Trotskyists. But he told me that n even though they marched together, the students and the workers, they never marched for the same thing. So in essence, mm. they were j physically in the same place, but politically they weren't. And in fact, throughout May, with the exception of young workers, and you know, everybody said, well, there'll be young workers. When I would ask, what happened when you talk to workers? Were there, were there workers who came to the student assemblies at the Sorbonne or wherever? Not they would always say young workers. Y and not many, though. And not many. You know, so, so uh, as you were saying, there's separate Mays there. The exactly. Student, the and workers. So there's a student May, right. which is, so all of the slogans yeah. that we've come to think of as being representative uh, of May, you know, uh, be realistic, demand the impossible, and, you know, all power to the imagination. Yeah. Uh, all the of dreamers. The, yeah, right. Every, every, all of that comes really out of, strictly out of the, the student students. movement. So and the, the workers wanted they wanted a raise a raise and, and economic and some economic wherewithal precisely and but they were also challenging the roots of uh, capitalism right they weren't calling for control of means of production the, or they or weren't some right they weren't calling there was the one of the unions okay there was. was one of the unions not, not the communist union 
If there was one, another union, the CFDT. Well, one would expect that if anybody, they would be the one. Well, right? no, the communists, though, did call for like the, the usual stuff. Association okay, yes, of right. banks uh, and that. Okay. And they were uh, really focused almost as much as on the wage uh, issue as on doing away with Gaullist power. Okay, because, you know, 10 ans ça suffit. Yeah. 10 years is enough. Right. And they wanted they would they they yeah. wanted to go out, which probably leads into why they supported the call. They didn't uh, object to the call for new elections that De Gaulle made uh, in late May. But anyway, so the students and the yeah. workers are really marching f for different things, even if they think they're marching for the same things, which the workers really didn't. So sort of pragmatically aligned here and there, and right. Okay, but. You know, the students, you know, the, all those demands are, for example. With stars in our eyes, the students There you go. Ima exactly. Yeah, imagine exactly right. They're with us. Exactly. And we are real revolutionaries. Right. Okay. And, it, and when the students regularly marched out to factories. Yeah. And this is like a really important point and a real bone of contention about, about May. And it's something that universally people who were students then say, when they went to the factories, one, the, s the factories were occupied, but it wasn't like in 1936 when there had also been a general strike when the Popular Front was elected. Because they said in 36 it was the workers who occupied the factories. Mm. Whereas in 68, it was really the union bureaucrats and the communist bureaucrats mm. who occupied the factories. Now, granted, I didn't interview people from every factory in France, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I did interview enough workers because I thought it was important. You know, most people, when they think of May, they think of Paris, but it was the whole country. It was Paris against the rest of the country. Well, that's what that was. That, that would be more the Paris Commune. In this the case, commune. it yeah. wasn't. Okay. There were places that were more yeah. every bit as militant, if not more militant, I than see. Paris. Okay. All right. And so there was. So, th really, the first city where the workers occupied a factory was Saint-Nazaire. Mm. You know, w w a city that most people couldn't even locate on a map. If I were to say, like, show me Saint-Nazaire. Yeah, yeah. But the workers at the, uh, at uh, Sud Aviation, I think it was, uh, an aviation factory, the union was led by a Trotskyist of a smaller sect. The Lambertists uh, uh, were the first ones to occupy a factory. So the students would go out to the factories to show their solidarity, and in most places, not all, but almost all, the workers told them to get lost. And in fact, one, uh, somebody from the naval, sh naval shipyards at Saint-Nazaire, somebody I have to I'll, I'll admit was a communist, communist leader, and a union leader, a leader of the CGT, the Communist mm -hmm. Union, when I said to him, and so what did you do when the students came out to the naval shipyard? He said, we kicked them in the ass. And similarly, when Kohn Bendit went to visit his brother in Saint Nazaire and wanted to speak, they didn't want him to speak. Shut him down. Or something and like he actually ended up having to speak on the beach. Interesting. So there was, so there was this huge split. So the question is, yeah. who was responsible? You know, when people say, you know, this, the, that it was the union leadership that wanted to keep everybody apart. That the, you know, the workers really wanted to unite with us, but they weren't allowed to. I've not seen much evidence of that, and except among young workers. And the fact is, the workers, to, to say that the workers wanted to, but they didn't, or they wanted to, but they couldn't, and that's the only reason we couldn't unite with them, as a way of uh, exculpating the workers, for mm. everything that happened, for the revolution not happening, is really, I have to say, anti-worker, because it denies them agency. I mean, the workers, if they supported the communists, they supported them because the communists spoke for them. And what you do so brilliantly, and I, I really, I know you're modest on this, but this is incredible investigative work. You are doing oral history in the in the finest of traditions. You're listening to Thank people. You. You're not coming in there with some preconceived, preordained paradigm as to what should or what was happening. You are actually listening to the people and figuring out the different sides and putting it together in a masterful way that 
again, generations can look at, and because we've got to figure this out, because this was a monumental opportunity, wasn't it? Well, I mean, you know, in, in you know, 68, and, and in France. Right. And, if and it was essentially blown. I mean, right. it was repressed. There certainly. you go. Okay, well, and you're going to get to that. I, you see, I don't, okay. I, you see, and, and that, you know, yeah. and that's, and that was just, that's just it. That when, uh, you know, thank you for the, you know, for the well, kind words, but uh, the, what happened was I went in, you know, I, I started doing this book, or I had the idea for this book. I mean, I'll just, it's a, just a, p a personal anecdote. May 68 was also, like, for me, yeah. the beginning of, like, real left-wing politics. You know, before I left for school, I was a junior at James Madison High School where Bernie Sanders went, as did Chuck Schumer. Okay. In Brooklyn. And in Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. In the bowels, the depths of Brooklyn. Bowels, as you pray, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but in the morning, you know, I was a typical American household. We had the TV on mm. at 7 o'clock, and there would be the footage of the previous day, the scenes of the previous day's demonstrations. And yeah. I was completely swept away by it. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was where I first discovered Marxism and, you know, the, the real left. And it was a couple of years ago. And that's in part why we're showing this to another generation, too. Right. Because young people today can't, is this real? Is this sort of like some picked, uh, you know, botched up uh, document? No, this is the real thing here. Right. What's going on? So, and all right. I just okay, and so what happened was I had been yeah. invited okay. to Paris to uh, present my translation of Jean Jaurès's Socialist history of the French Revolution. Mm. And after the talk, it was at the Ecole Normale where Althusser, Lacan, everybody taught. And after the, my talk, I, I left with a, a communist publisher. And when we got to Gay Lussac, who Gay Lussac, which is where all the rioting was, mm -hmm. he said to me, You know, I was here almost 50 years ago that night. Mm. And I said, Wow. And I realized time is flying. And in fact, in 1968, is as far from us mm. as 1968 was from the trenches of World War One. Yeah. And somebody needs to talk to these people, Absolutely. and I think it should be me. I think it should be. And, and, and it was. Okay. And yeah, but also, mm. I went, so I went into it with kind of like the starry-eyed thing that you said at the mm. beginning, because this really was such an essential event for me. Now, of course, like everybody else, I've become considerably more cynical since then. Nevertheless, May 68, was still for me the great shining moment. You know, if, there if everything else was screwed, May 68 yeah, wasn't. Even that. if it failed, just like the Paris Commune. That was ours. Right. And, and it was a sign, it was a, an actual real life experience of communard on the left, right? And uh, it was in the West. Which is, uh, right. It's a w how would you defi uh, translate that? You know, that, that, what, it, that it, what it was was, it was clearly, nobody, nobody calls it a revolution anymore. Right. It's always the events. Events. But okay. I Rebellions. Think, right, or okay. an uprising. Even uprising. my book calls it an uprising. Okay. But in fact... A real revolution would have been something quite... But different. I don't know. You see, that's no, why I'll okay. ask you, Jim. That w okay, imagine a country yeah, where yeah. every worker is on strike. Yeah, yeah, okay? exactly. Every yeah. school is closed down. Right. Now what? What do you call it? If that ain't a revolution, then I don't know what it's it is. Well, it's certainly a with withholding of support for the system. Well, <laughs> but massively. Now, what was so? Then what is a revolution? What is and and revolutionaries need to have that vision and well as some sort of what uh, program? But but do or you or can you do, or do you, you right, or, does can it, you or does it evolve out exactly? Or are there some basic principles right. that? transcend any any action but strikes democracy for example but, but strikes everywhere okay so, and when we're talking about when we're talking about workers and students no longer all on strike i understand then clearly what you have is something bigger than just an event okay and yet it failed and yet it failed because of again the the, the, the brute force of but but was it the brute force i mean we might be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves okay but or the, the alternative. Okay, let me, let me talk about, let's, th let's talk about brute force. And okay. this is actually a really important element in May 68. The societal reaction to it. Okay, now, the in fact, the brutality, you know, there are, we all, there's all footage of, uh, you know, the cops and the CRS, the, it's too complicated to explain these various but levels yeah, of scurry. Okay. It wasn't, it was rather modest. Is that, it, yeah, it was, it was, it was beyond modest right. because 
There were two reasons, or a number of reasons, but a very important one is so many of the people high up in French government, French society, it was their kids who were on the barricades. Yeah. You ain't firing on their sons. Point. You're great just not doing yeah. it. Yeah. And so there's that. Which is what, of course, happened also in America. But okay, but let's, let's go to America. We had more people killed in the days after the invasion of Cambodia. Jackson State. Jackson and State, State and Kent State than they had in the entire six weeks in France. And that should be emphasized. This, this occurred within six weeks. Right. We're talking about, and then that was, everyone you know, sort of went back. Everything, everything like frittered out, you know. Right. But the fact no, is, it, yeah. there was one, and it's something that, uh, how many people were killed is a subject of debate. Right. In France. Right, right. Because there was Could one. A heart was attack, by the way. Right. The, the, the heart attack. There was a policeman. Right. Who died. He was run over. He was thought he was in Lyon. He was thought he was run over by a truck. L somebody went to jail for it. But later on, it was determined that he died of a heart attack. Okay. Mm. I spoke to the person who was the head of the March 22nd movement in Lyon. He's still very defensive about this. Mm, mm. There was one other person around this time, an innocent bystander who was, who was uh, killed accidentally, okay? So that takes us in the month of May. There's two people. Then in June, there is a high school student who drowns, right. Gilles Totin, who went to a, a Renault factory in Flans. He was, cops were chasing him, he ran, he jumped into the river, didn't know how to swim, sunk, and he died. There were two workers at Sochaux at a Peugeot factory who was shot and killed, just flat out okay, killed. Yeah. And then later on, there's one other death, kind of after the events, during the electoral campaign, a communist putting up electoral posters was, was killed by a bunch of right-wing thugs. We're not talking about the eight days where 20,000 people lost their lives, were killed in reaction to the Paris Commune. Right. So, so that we want to make that very Nor clear. Nor are we talking about so obviously, even America yeah. after Kent State. Exactly. Or What's Mexico City, uh, you know, the, uh, the in, in the summer, things. right. Yeah. So the, the, even though people were beat up, and, and people told me interesting stories about how, you know, the cops were, you know, they were bad, but they weren't all that bad. Yeah. And yeah. people usually compliment the, the prefect of police uh, of Paris at the time. And two people, one who I spoke to and one who I read, Combendit and Alain Crevin, both said they were thanked by the police for keeping stuff under mm. control so that it never really yeah, went out yeah. at, you know. Yeah. So there were the, the bad nights of the barricades, May 10th, and then again on May 24th. But it wasn't repression yeah, that no, killed right. it. So it that's, that's the question. Well, why not revolution? What constitutes that? And what's that going to be all about? And, and, and yeah. Sure, and, and does it have to include a, a basic redistribution of wealth in some way, but also a whole bunch of other stuff, as well as workers taking or Take okay. control of the means of production. Okay, I'll ask you the question now, Jim. Well, Ready? <laughs> okay. It's 1905 it. in Russia. Yeah, yeah. We call it the revolution, you know, 1905 right. revolution. Right. Did it succeed? No. No. It, it, it got rid of the czar and that was... Right. Yeah. But we call it a revolution. Yeah. And why revolution don't we call 1905, right? And right. why don't we call 1968 a revolution? Well, as you're arguing, it should be a rebellion. An it, but it's not. It's a revolution. It's it was a revolution. It, it was one that just failed. I s okay. And so I think yeah, by, I by not okay. calling it a revolution, yeah. it's just a way of, again, burying the failure. At this time, burying it uh, linguistically. Because if it was an event, and there were some people I spoke to who insisted it was an event, it was not a revolution. Because, like, who cares, you know, a revolution. It's a real important point you make. But it yeah. and, and, I don't, and I don't necessarily think, I mean, I say many things, some of which I agree with. But some of the stuff I say I don't agree with, and I'm just trying to find, struggling to find the answer. And a lot of the stuff yeah. about May, I still, you know, haven't really satisfied myself. And sometimes I write and I speak just in the hope of something coming out that yeah. I hadn't thought yeah, of. Yeah. We're all in the same boat. And right. I, of course, I was, as you know, I was telling you, we'll have Mark Wright on next week. Uh, I, I was at Columbia in 68. And we're, they're having major events and dialogues about the same thing. Yeah. And you know what? We, we should maybe try and get that clip. Right. Uh, perfect time. time. Perfect time for the intense now. Right. Uh, the clip from the uh, this documentary that we 
uh, I met you at right. uh, Film Forum. So let me tell a little bit about the film. Is yeah, please tell. The me. film is by the uh, terrific Brazilian filmmaker Joel Moreira Salles, okay. and it's a film essay on May. And the starting point of the film is, or the central question of the film is, what happens when happiness dies? That when hope dies, when what you thought was going to happen doesn't. So he starts with, with footage about his mother visiting China in 1966 or 67, I can't remember. And which leads him to, m and his mother was happy, and later she wasn't. And then he goes to, to Paris, uh, and you have the sheer joy, like what Carlos Fuente said about the kissing. Yeah, yeah. Everybody talks about it. That on street corners, everybody argued, everybody discussed. People talked to strangers that they never, right? Never, never would have. They never did it before, before and right. they never did it afterwards. And feeling the camaraderie, right? right. And, and if each other's humanity. And yeah. if you know, when you watch films of the era, for example, you know William Klein's great film, uh, the English title is May Days. I would say a third of the film is people arguing on street corners. Because, because all the barriers fell between yeah, people yeah, that yeah, normally yeah, exist yeah. In, in any city. But people were happy and living differently. Mm -hmm. So maybe now we can see what Joao is. Yeah, we, we have a, a trailer on that. Uh, so let's, uh, let's put that on if we can. L'objet de cette explosion, vous avez en entendu une autre explosion, là je pense une troisième maintenant, obligeant ainsi les étudiants à reculer nous-mêmes. Qui antes vivia calado, agora se sentia vontade para tomar a palavra. Estudantes, operários, garçons. Alguma coisa nova brotava, comovente e vital. Il est allé, je vous avoue, il est allé manifester au boulevard Saint-Michel. Mais oui, oh, mais, mais, mais il reviendra ce soir, madame. Nous sommes d'accord avec l'occupation de notre pays. Protestons. Je pense que la majorité des amateurs se filmaient par impulse, parce que la histoire était passée. E eles eram a parte fraca. Só o que podiam fazer era prestar testemunho. As imagens são amadoras. Não foram feitas para a história. São apenas as sobras de um momento na vida. Elas registram o encontro de minha mãe com a realidade de um país oposto a tudo que ela conhecia. Ela foi feliz na China e por isso gosto de pensar nela lá, quando tudo parecia possível. <coughs> Back when everything seemed possible. Right. And you know, and, and that's what the film is about, and that's uh, part of the tragedy of, of May 68, because everything did seem possible. And then it didn't happen. And so it's something that Joao shows in the film. He has clips from another f absolutely brilliant film on the French left and on May 68, called uh, Mourir à 30 ans, to die at 30. I can't remember what the English title is. Mm. And in the film, and in, 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 uh, in the Intense Now, there's a moment where it reads off the names of people who were uh, left-wing militants who committed suicide. Yeah. And the film is about somebody who was uh, uh, a leader in the, in the Trotskyist movement who himself committed suicide after dedicating himself heart and soul to the movement because the revolution was, you know, oh, it's next Wednesday. Yeah. And next Wednesday never seems to come. And in May 68, it looked like it had come. And then when May 68 ended, it's now I'm thinking about it, when May 68 ends and the assumption is that it failed 
assumption on the left, that it failed only because of the communists, mm. then people have all the more hope. Because if, if you say that it was the fault of the communists, then it's not the fault of the working class. This could have happened had the communists not gotten in the way. If we now go to the working class, this is all going to happen. And so many people go to work in factories. The Maoists go work in factories, you know, called etabli, uh, mm -hmm. implants. Mm -hmm. And they all go work in factories, and they live the life. They give up their educations. They give up everything to go work in factories because, you know, the workers, if they didn't play the role they were supposed to play, they will next time. Yeah. But then next time doesn't come. You know, there were people who said to me, my question about 1905, you know, we viewed, even then, we viewed May as our 1905. You know, leading up, they'll, later on, there'll be a 1917. Yeah. But my question was, in 1905, they thought that 1905 was their 1917. They didn't go into the revolution. The Russians didn't this go into it. 1905. This was exactly, this, this is moment. it. This is their moment. Seize they the moment. They were lucky they had World War I. Yeah. And it led to, to 1917. 1968 was 1968. That was the moment. And this is also something that I think is important in, uh, in, in the intense now. Because he has in the film a moment that really got me to think about this thing about the many Mays of May 68. In the film, there are scenes of the funeral of the high school student, Gilles Totin, the Maoist high school student, there are uh, and there are only students at this at the funeral. It was a huge funeral with the Père Lachaise, the big famous cemetery, and they marched through the streets of Paris with their clenched fists mm. uh, and singing the Internationale. But you look at the crowd; there's not a single worker at it. Mm. And then this footage also of the funeral of one of the workers killed at Sochaux, Pierre Bellot. There's not a student at it. It's nothing but students, uh, nothing, nothing but workers. Mm. But there's also footage of the other France, which is the one that gets left out, and Joël talks about it in the film, that gets left out in the left-wing narrative. And I give you know, Joël credit for putting it in the film. There's footage of the funeral of uh, La Croix, the policeman killed in Lyon. And that's the other France. And it's the one that the left forgot about. It's the France of people who went to this funeral with suits and ties on. More the establishment. The establishment. But it was France. Yes. And another, th you know, uh, something that I asked, you know, most of the pe almost everybody about when I interviewed them was, on May 30th, de Gaulle uh, announces that he's, you know, he's not resigning. There's gonna, he's going to dissolve parliament, and there's going to be new elections. And there's a monstrous demonstration on the Champs Elysees. And in fact, it was the biggest demonstration during May. Uh, half a million? Or half a million half people. Million, yeah. Half a million people. And all these numbers are kind of you know, yeah, yeah, fluid. Yeah, but yeah, never yeah. but it, if it wasn't the biggest, it was as near to it as sure. you, you want to be. And I asked people, what did you think? And there were some who were dismissive. Well, you know, it's just the bourgeoisie. There was one person who even told me, I heard that it was the same people just walking around in circles. But if you see footage of it, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people, yeah, and those people, even Donald Trump can say it was fake, right? <laughs> exactly, and that's well, he could, he, he could, would. he could, but, it, uh, but, uh, but okay. it, right. Yeah. right. But the fact is, there was this huge that that they didn't see it, that the students yeah. and the, the students were so focused on themselves, yeah. on their dreams, and on their hopes. Nar right. certain extent they're narcissistic uh, you know th that's the way we could look at it now yeah. exactly well or is it they were young and they saw what they want to see i mean if i was young you know and that was my question i said when people say oh you know we didn't think it was going to lead to anything i would say please yeah. you were 18 years old you were 16 years old you were 22 years old don't tell me you didn't think this was it right but the reality was the goal continued. Right. And we in America had Nixon. So there was, and with every, if you want to call it a movement or a rebellion, there's going to be a counter movement. Yep. And, and I think 
those of us who are interested in these sorts of things, uh, scholars, writers, filmmakers, activists, so on, we've got to realize that. I yep. mean, uh, we're not living in some sort of self-contained world here. There are other people out there. I, I, I gosh, we're. I, I wish we could. You're gonna have to come back. I mean, I, we got. We just. My pleasure. I, it, you know, we're just touching on things here, tip of the iceberg. But uh, I mean, that, I'm so attracted to people like uh, Reverend William Barber, poor people's mu movement, and fusion politics, and and how can we bring people together who we have pretty much rejected and and uh, you know humiliated also. You're not gonna get them back by calling them names either. You've got to reach out and understand where they're coming from, right? Right. And, and, and your work. But, you, you know, the, you illustrates know that, that. that even people, you know, one of the person who I came out of May 68, the thinker who I came out of May 68, the most attracted to was somebody named uh, uh, Cornelius Castoriadis, okay. who was the founder of the group called Socialism or Barbarism. And he came to realize that the working class was no longer a revolutionary class. You know, it, it was kind of a Marcusean conclusion, but it, through a different route, that they've been private, the, the, the privatization of the working class, that they had s uh, achieved so much success, relative success, under capitalism, they, they were no longer interested. Pacified. Right. And, and so they were, it was hopeless. And then that was they why they wanted more of some of the material. Exactly. They, that they, they have their the frigo. Right. But oh. I wanted to read something, though, from Priska Bachelet. All right. We've got. Two minutes. But Two, let me say, oh, here we go. For, okay. 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 We were constantly doing work with the rank and file, assemblies and all that. But while we were doing this, the Socialist Party reconstituted itself. Mm. The right remobilized, working like crazy while we didn't. Right. And while we assumed intellectual hegemony, this is the post-May 68, we didn't notice that the bosses were reorganizing and modernizing, that there was new management. We miss the central axes, which leaves us in the situation we're now in. And I think that if there is a lesson of May 68, because we're never going to have that kind of revolution here, nor will they ever have it again, it was this. It was, they were so focused on their, their own Michigas that they missed what was going on on the other side. I think that's a perfect way to end this show and, and how your brilliant work illustrates the need to get out of our own Michigas and try to understand the other guy's Michigas. So I prefer to bury myself in hours, but still. All right, all right. <laughs> and, and Mitch, it's been terrific. I, oh, I thank you so very you. much. It was, it was great. a great show, and we're going to see you all next week. This is Jim Vretos. Thank you again for watching The Radical Imagination, and we're going to go out with Phil Oaks and his song uh elegiac song uh, i'm sorry yeah and it's entitled um when i'm gone i just sort of forget it for a moment there because it's a beautiful song we'll see you again next week on the radical imagination phil oaks when i'm gone <laughs>